Good morning, church. Greetings in the name of our Lord. It is good to be together to sing our praises to our great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I do want to welcome any guests who are here in person for worship with us this morning. Welcome those who are joining us online. Um, to our guests here with us, if you'd like to share a little bit of, uh, about yourself with us, we do have some new to URC cards there in your pew rack, and you could fill one of those out if you'd like to and drop it off in the offering plate and tell us about yourself. If not, we'd hope to meet you at the conclusion of our service. I do want to call our attention to uh, one of the announcements there in our bulletin. Uh, there you see the nominating committee introduction. We have a deadline. October 20th is the deadline for church members to submit their nominees for elder and deacon. And there you can see instructions there in the bulletin and who to contact. And so I'd encourage you to prayerfully uh, consider that and to uh, look into that this week. Before we prepare our hearts for worship and a time of quiet prayer, um, I do want to invite you to return this evening uh, to close this Lord's Day in worship. We have our 6 p.m. service tonight. Uh, one of our elders, Nick Setterington, who's also um, the leader of our international ministry, our international ministry director, will be preaching from 1 Thessalonians this evening. So I'd invite you back to worship to close this Sunday. Now, Let's take a moment and quiet prayer to prepare our hearts. A call to worship this morning is from Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham his servant, children of Jacob his chosen ones, sing to him. Sing praises to him. Let us stand and open our praise together, singing the God of Abraham praise.
Psalm 96, verses 1 through 6. So sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let us pray to this God this morning. O Lord, how, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have shown us your glory in the world and in your word so that every possible way that we might know that you are great, we see it. We see it in your holiness, for your great in dignity and your great in power and your great in justice and in wisdom and in mercy. Lord, when we gaze at a beautiful sky, clearly it is the work of your fingers. Or when we admire the infinite order and creativity of your universe, how, how can we even wonder? How do you see us? How are we on your mind? Who are we that you've come near in the person of Christ to care for us? We thank you for the undeserved covenant love you've poured out on us. God, you're unshakable in your faithfulness and your righteousness, and we ask you, would you reign in our hearts as we worship together this morning? Help us to recognize and to rejoice in your kingship, for you are the great judge of all the peoples. Yes, your word tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We long for that day and we thank you even now for gathering us here in this room and across the whole earth to sing with united voices and hearts of your redeeming grace. We ask you now, would you fill our minds and our spirits with your all-satisfying love? We pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
whom God of all of history enthroned in realms of light what eyes of faith have strained to see will one day fill our sight with all the saints will be our you to join me as I come before the Lord for our prayer of confession and hear his assurance of pardon and grace to us. <clears throat> Please pray with me. Our covenant-keeping faithful God, we ask you even as we come before you now with singing and in prayer, would you tune the dials of our hearts to be rightly amazed by your goodness? In love, Lord Jesus, you called us to come to you, every one of us who's groaning under sin's burden, and you'll give us rest. You invite us to exchange our anxieties and our fears for the relief of your grace, for you are gentle and you're lowly in heart. We hear this invitation, and yet some days, some of us turn away, for we love being in control or at least thinking that we're in control. As you taught your disciples in Matthew 5, you spoke of the kingdom of heaven being for those who are poor in spirit. You promised comfort to those who mourn. You pledged the inheritance of the earth to those who are meek and lowly. You spoke of satisfaction for those who long for righteousness, of pouring mercy out on the merciful, of giving clear sight to the pure in heart. But we are struggling, Lord, to be poor in spirit, for we think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We think the biggest problems in this world are outside us, not inside us. Often we're nothing short of meticulous when we spot the sins of others, yet we're drowsy and we're even unaffected when it comes to our own sin. And Father, we know we've not been meek. Unlike our Savior, we have not had gentle spirits. We've been easily provoked. We've been too quick to take offense. It seems we aren't people who take well to ask, being asked to endure trials patiently. We struggle to hide in the shadow of your wing. Yes, and all of that said, we're actually quite good at hungering and thirsting. But forgive us, Lord, we confess it is not always for your righteousness. We've been people that have leaned hard into the search for satisfaction. But we ask your forgiveness for not looking to the hills, to the heavens where our help comes from. Looking to you, Lord. And we could easily go on, for our sins are many, but we'd like to focus on the fact that your compassion is so much greater than our sins. So again, we turn to you and we think of how the man Jesus Christ has been perfect as a peacemaker in our place. He's been perfectly pure in heart, though we're not. He suffered ridicule patiently, though we haven't. And he valued the kingdom of God above all else. So would you help us, Holy Spirit, to live more like Jesus. We want to delight in him and to feel the blessing that is ours as we stand covered in his righteousness. We lift our hands to you now, Lord, and we ask you to be faithful, 
to the things that you have started in us. Will you complete that work? And would you carry out the good works you've prepared for us that we should walk in them? We pray all of this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who is even now interceding for us. Amen. Brothers and sisters, 1 Peter 2, 22 through 25 says, Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on his, the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Would you please stand as we sing a song of thanksgiving to this merciful and great God. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what Thou art. I am finding out the greatness of Thy loving heart. Thou hast been me gaze upon Thee, and Thy beauty fills my soul. By thy transforming power, thou hast made me whole. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy Yes. 
I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Please be seated. I would ask our ushers to come forward now. Uh, we continue our worship uh, this Lord's Day morning with the giving of our offerings. We give for the glory of God. We give in gratitude for what has been given to us in our Lord Jesus Christ and his gospel. And we give for the advance of the gospel here in mid-Michigan and internationally and across the globe. So each week we call our attention to, um, during the offering, one of our ministry highlights. Uh, this is one of the ministries outside of the local ministry here that we support, Words of Hope, which is an evangelistic radio ministry broadcast. You can see a little bit of information about them. Would you today at your house at some point uh, pray for this ministry and throughout the week lift them up to the Lord that they uh, would be blessed with the power of the Holy Spirit in their endeavors? time for our congregational prayer. I will lead us in praying for one another. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Our great and mighty God, worthy are you to receive all glory, honor, and power. You have created all things and by your will they existed and were created. You are the God of all history you are the God of providence. You are the God of our redemption. And there are times where we do not quickly recognize your hand at work, but we know that you are at work. We know that you are ruling all things for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your people. We know that you are working in our lives and we seek to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is you, our great God, who is at work among us and in us. And so we give thanks that we've seen the power of your word among us. We've seen its power to convict, to save, and to transform sinners. And we ask that it would continue to have that effect in our lives and in our community. We ask that your spirit would so magnify the scriptures that our hearts and minds are consumed with it and that by your word working in us, our desire to be like you, Jesus, would increase. We do ask that you would increase 
our hunger for the truth, that you would give us a distaste for lies. Increase our joy in knowing you through the study of your word. Lord, we ask for one another that we would enjoy sweet times of fellowship with you, our great God. As your people, united by the gospel, knit together in Christ Jesus, we ask that you would deepen our relationships with one another. May our conduct towards one another be holy, righteous, and blameless. As a church family, may we exhort and encourage one another to walk in a manner worthy of our God, walking alongside each other. In doing so, may we have an increase in our love for you and for one another. May our love abound, and may it abound beyond the bounds of this fellowship, that it would be a witness to those in darkness around us. We are those who've been saved by a wonderful Savior, who are loved by a great God, and who love one another, and may it be part of our witness to our community around us. It is our desire that we would live in such a way that pleases you. It is our desire that we would walk in your will. And we know that your word says that your will for each of us is our sanctification. That we would become more and more like Christ. So we ask that you would help us abstain from what is contrary to godliness. Lord, may the fruit of your spirit be evident in our lives and help us to control our bodies our mouths, our minds, our imaginations. Keep us from the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We don't want to go back to living like those who do not know you. Instead, help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only. It is our humble prayer that we would live honorable lives growing in holiness every day. No longer walking in darkness, but living in the life. Living alertly. Living fully in the light of Christ. Help us to put on the breastplate of faith and love. And for a helmet, the hope of our salvation. We pray for one another that you, God, Holy Spirit, our sanctifier, that we would be set apart spirit, soul, and body, and kept blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus. We pray for those among us, God, who are hurting, who need to know your comfort. Lord, this past week, there were several families connected to our church family that have lost loved ones have lost fathers. We lift them up to you in their time of grief. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be near to them. Give them strength. May they grieve well. May they grieve with those who have hope, knowing that their loved ones did belong to you. And we remember others among us who in this past year and in recent times have lost Parents, friends, siblings, children, and grandchildren. That you would continue to mend broken hearts. That you would continue to fix their eyes on heaven. And that as in the midst of their hurting, they would live with the hope of heaven carrying them through. Make us a hopeful people, God. Keep us a hopeful people. That as we disperse from this place, that as we go out into our neighborhoods and into our work, into our schools, into our campuses, that we would carry the hope of the gospel and that we'd have a ready answer for those who would ask why we have such hope. So we ask for your Spirit's help that we ourselves will be grounded and rooted in the love of God that has come to us in Christ Jesus and ready and willing and excited to share that with others. Lord, we lift up, Lord, our community. 
We pray that as saints, we would be those who walk as light in the darkness. We pray for those who work at the Capitol. May they be your ambassadors there. We pray those who work for our major employers in the community, they, may they be your ambassadors there. We pray for those on the college's camp, college campuses, especially of Michigan State, whether students, faculty, administration, staff, we pray, Lord, that they would be your ambassadors there, sharing the good news of reconciliation with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. May we go from worship today. May we be shaped in such a way that we delight in doing your will, that our goal is to bring you glory, and that we lift up your name in all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts for the preaching of God's word, singing together, Jesus is mine. Please stand. Fade each earthly joy, Jesus is mine. Stronger than fleeting hopes, Jesus is mine. Dark is the of fragile peace Jesus is mine Through tearful nights of grief Jesus is mine His voice commands the storm
Please be seated. Now, if you would, please take a Bible in hand and turn to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 8, you're 10 chapters too early. If you're using a Bible in the pew rack, you want to turn to page 877. There are two parables that begin Luke 18. We'll look at the second in verses 9 through 14. If you were here last week, um, a major application from uh, Pastor Jason's sermon was the recognition and the exhortation um, to think about the cross, the recognition that we don't think about the cross enough, and the exhortation to. Um, here, in, in a break from that series in Matthew, for one week, I want to serve that purpose and look at a parable that reminds us of our need for the cross and the need that our very hearts have for beholding our Savior on the cross and seeing His work and the necessity of it. The two parables that begin Luke 18, one is the persistent widow. Um, this is a widow who goes to a judge and pleads for justice. Um, it's a parable about faith and faith's determination. The second parable is one of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, two men who go into the temple to pray. Uh, one leaves right with God. The other uh, leaves and is not right with God. And from there and from the tax collector, we see in this parable the humility of faith. Before I read God's word this morning, let us go to him and ask for his help in prayer once again. So please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word and we recognize our need for help to understand it. We thank you that you have promised your Holy Spirit for all who ask, and so we ask for your Holy Spirit's help this morning. That as your word is read and as it is expounded, that you may speak to our hearts what you have inspired in your word, that we might gaze upon the glory of our Savior, that we might increase in our understanding of who you are, that we might know you and walk with you, and that we might live for your glory as we grow in the grace of our Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the word of God from Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. Amen. And that ends this reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. May he write its eternal truth on all our hearts. The greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. One 
is the priority, but they are linked. A consequence of a life aimed at loving God first and above all else induces a love for those made in God's image. The order is important. God first, people second, but the two greatest commandments, they go together. The way we treat others indicates something about our relationship with God. This shows up again and again in the scriptures. Here are a couple examples where we see the link between the first and the second commandment. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 through 21. This is addressed to Christians. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. John is saying, don't be deceived. Don't make a false claim to love God if you can't love your fellow Christian. Husbands, this one's for you. It's from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. There the apostle addresses the husbands, saying, Likewise, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Husbands, don't be deceived. You think you're going to have sweet fellowship with the Lord in prayer, but you're insensitive and demeaning to your wife? You go from prayer to being rude and obnoxious to your precious wife? There's something amiss. There's something off. Your prayers will be hindered. Here's one for worship from the Sermon on the Mount in Jesus Matthew 5, 23, 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. If there's hostility between worshipers, there won't be freedom in worship and these things, conflicts, offenses, bitterness need to be addressed. You're relating to God and you're relating to others is not mutually exclusive. The way we treat others indicates something about our relationship with God. And here Jesus, in telling this parable, this is another case where we see the, the linking of the two great commandments, if you would. That the way we think and treat others reveals something of our heart towards God. That's where Jesus and Luke here recounting Jesus' intent for the parable, we are steered that way. We are told who the audience is and the purpose of the parable there. Look back at verse 9. He, being Jesus, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Now, many would say that the Pharisees were the first audience that Jesus had in mind, but it, it's not the case. There may be Pharisees who were included in this audience, but the audience are those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Oftentimes, you and I, we find ourselves in such an audience. And as Jesus identifies contempt of others, he's identifying a symptom of a terrible sickness. A sickness that demonstrates that something is amiss with your relationship with God. So that's the first thing I want us to see, particularly from verse 9, that contempt is a terrifying symptom. Understand that this parable isn't just to condemn showing contempt towards others, but contempt shows a greater problem. What does contempt mean? To make an account of someone a low account no account of them, to despise them. It's to think of someone as beneath consideration or even worthy of scorn. That is what treating someone else with contempt is like. And you and I are very vulnerable to it. 
Contempt shows up in different degrees in our lives, sometimes in ways that are more troubling than others. Sometimes it just happens to us. You're somewhere and you see someone wearing the colors of a rival team. And immediately there is a prejudice that rises up in you because they have those colors on. There is contempt. There shouldn't be necessarily. You don't know them. They could be just a really great guy. For all you know, they could be a brother and sister in the Lord. But because they are wearing maize and blue or whatever the team that would stir up contempt in you, it stirs up contempt. Or maybe you've had this experience. You thought someone was a friend. You thought you were peers, someone that you were proud to hang out with. And then you rode in their car and you saw their CD collection. Now, that's not really the way people ride in cars anymore. Um, most of the time it's Bluetooth and most new vehicles don't even offer a CD player. But there was a time where you would sit down in someone's car, maybe for the first time you grabbed their CD booklet or their CDs were there on their visor and you looked up and you're like, I don't know if I could be a friend with someone who listens to Nickelback <laughs> or the Bee Gees or Backstreet Boys, whoever it may be. Here Jesus is pointing to contempt that is a serious symptom of a deadly cancer. What is that cancer? Is the cancer of self-righteousness. There's a great self, uh, definition of self-righteousness there. Who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. To be self-righteous is to believe that you are good enough or have done enough to be accepted by God. And the way that contempt works with self-righteousness and exposes self-righteousness is that deep down you know you're not good enough and you can't do enough. But if you can find someone that you believe that you're better than, ah, it bolsters your self-righteousness. You find someone to compare yourself to. Someone in order to validate your belief in your own righteousness. I must be on guard against self-righteousness. You must be on guard against self-righteousness. What is the ultimate danger of self-righteousness? Is that when it goes unchecked, it convinces you that you're accepted by God when you're not. When you're not right with God. So if you have contempt for others, does that unveil a heart of self-righteousness? And when we speak about contempt today, we're quick to thinking about what happens online, on social media, where people go back and forth. In our day of identity politics, where you find out someone doesn't exactly line up where you are on everything, and it's not a matter of agree to disagree, it is you are my enemy, and where literal neighbors become literal enemies because of the contempt that is pervasive and promoted in our country and our culture, that's that's sad. That's tragic. But the contempt that we find in this parable is even more tragic. Because think about the context of this parable. These are two men who've come to the temple to pray together. And one has contempt for the other who is there with him in worship. Look how contempt rears its ugly head demonstrating the Pharisee's self-righteousness that here is a man in his congregation that he is belittling in order to exalt himself, to justify himself, to hold himself up. Here it is in prayer that his contempt finds expression. Woe to us and how Grievous is it to have contempt for one another within the family of God. Contempt is a symptom of self-righteousness and we must pay attention how we view others. 
And the danger of self-righteousness is the second thing I want us to see. The danger of self-righteousness is that it leads to false assurance. You think about verses 10 and 12. And here we begin with thinking about the man, the Pharisee. We're told that there are two men. They both come to pray. And so we consider both of their prayers. First, the, prayer, the Pharisee. Now, this is one of the ways that Luke, in preserving and recording and sharing Jesus' teaching for us, he draws out one of the ways that Jesus really drove a point home to his audience. And some of you may remember me telling you this before, that one of Luke's literary techniques he really wants to, to, to show you is how Jesus used the surprise when he told the story. And that's how he drove his point home. But the surprise is somewhat lost on us because we have some familiarity, most of us, with this parable in some sense. And so we're inclined to immediately think Pharisee bad guy, tax collector good guy. But that wasn't the case. No, that's the surprise that it was the Pharisee who went home and wasn't justified. That would have been a surprise because for the, the audience of Jesus' parable, the Pharisee was the, the pillar of the community. The Pharisees, they were a lay movement among Jews. And that they were the ones, they weren't the elite ruling class, they weren't the super wealthy, they were the devoted ones. And they were devoted to God's law and to God's word. And so think of the most admired person you know from your life. Maybe, or maybe it's someone you studied in history that you hold up on a pedestal as a moral example that you would hope that your kids would aspire to be like. Someone that you look up to. This is what the audience would have heard when Jesus said, a Pharisee. And so when they hear that the Pharisee begins to pray, they're taking note. This would be a good prayer. We should pray like this. And that's what Jesus turns on them. Here, the Pharisee begins his prayer, and his prayer very quickly demonstrates his self-congratulating pride and exalting of himself. But before we get too far into the prayer, we do need to notice that this man, if you look back there in verse 11, he begins with God. The prayer begins pretty good. God, I thank you. It's off to a good start. Here, this is helpful for us to see that in this man's self-righteousness, he didn't exclude any need for grace. No, he, there's a recognition of the grace of God in his life. He recognizes part of the reason why I am the man that I am is because of God. And he begins with giving thanks. Self-righteousness and false assurance itself, there could be a recognition for grace. The problem is that it underestimates how much grace we actually need. See, this Pharisee, he's not a, a, a Pelagian. Pelagius was a 5th century British monk who denied original sin and believed that people were born innocent without the corruption of sin and therefore could live fully obedient lives to God. Basically, man had the capability to live a sinless life in Pelagian's view. No, he's not a Pelagius. He understands that, no, he owes to God thanks for even the righteousness that he is exercising. No, he's not a Pelagius follower. He's more this Pharisee is what we see in the Roman Catholic tradition. Roman Catholics believe that salvation comes through grace, but it's grace plus effort. Grace plus participation in the sacraments of the church. Grace plus that leads to justification and sanctification. What's absent is the adjective alone. 
And that salvation is coming by grace and by grace alone. That's the difference between Protestants and Roman Catholics. And this is what is missing from this Pharisee's prayer. There's the recognition of grace, but he doesn't have the adjective alone. What does he thank God for? Well, he thanks God for good things, that he's not an extortioner, that he's not a cheat. He thanks God that he is unjust, that he is honest in all his dealings. He thanks God that he is not an adulterer. This man is faithful to his wife. Here, he is defining his righteousness by what he abstains from. He's saying, I'm righteous because I don't do these things. And to be clear, the world would be a much better place if we had more men like this Pharisee. If we had men who were faithful to their families, faithful to their wives, men who acted with integrity in all their dealings, men who did not extort or did not take advantage of the vulnerable, the world would be a better place. The problem is that it's a shallow righteousness. Because you and I, to some extent, can constrain ourselves in outward obedience, but not have hearts that delight in God and delight in His righteousness and are doing these things for His glory. There are good motives to be a good businessman, but you can do that and do that apart from the grace of God. There are very good reasons to stay faithful to your spouse, and you can do that as an unbeliever because the consequences of divorce are expensive and they hurt and it's painful. And so therefore, there's other motives. And it would appear that this man has other motives for his obedience and it would appear that the motive is exalting himself. And that's evidence in his quick contempt for the tax collector. Then in verse 12, it's not just what he abstains from that he has built up this mound of self-righteousness. It is what he has gone above and beyond to do. There it says that he fasts twice a week. Now, fasting in the Jewish law was only required on the Day of Atonement. This man fasts, most likely observing the Tuesday and the Thursday fast. Here, his devotion to God isn't just meeting the expectations of God's law, but actually it's hit him in his stomach. He has gone above and beyond. He is demonstrating that he is serious, so much so that he would abstain from food. But it's not only that it hits him in his stomach, it also hits him in his wallet that he is going above and beyond. He is a, a super tither. The Pharisees were devout with their wallets. They combed through the Old Testament and they looked for every prescribed tithe. And as far as we could tell, most Pharisees were tithing somewhere north of 20% of their income. This guy, it may have even been more than that because he says, I tithe all that I get. It would insinuate that he's not just merely in tithing his income, but all the intake. So Whatever he profits off from whatever business he's in, he gives a tithe. But then when he goes and spends his money at the market and he brings something home, then those things he brought home, lettuce or whatever it is, he tithes from that as well. Something that someone else has already tithed on. He's a super tither. He's gone above and beyond. He is into works of super irrigation, more than duty requires. And here he has built up this case. But as Jesus informs us, the grounds of his assurance are false assurance. His prayer shows us that he underestimates his need for grace. He is emphasizing what he is able to outwardly avoid without doing the deep work of devotion from his heart. He celebrates where he has gone above and beyond. But in fasting and giving extra money, he can do that without walking in fellowship with the Lord. Now, when we hear Pharisee, we tend to think hypocrite. 
It's important to recognize that in this parable, this man is not presented as a hypocrite. He has done much that is righteous. A hypocrite is someone who plays the part, who talks a good game, but when no one is looking, they live the opposite. It would appear that this man is, in a sense, speaking with integrity when he makes these claims about his own righteousness. The problem is that it's not enough righteousness to cover his sins. The problem is not that he's a hypocrite, it's that he's self-deceived. He believed he is right with God based on what he's done. And he's in a very scary situation where there's nothing in his conscience that is driving him to God, pleading for mercy. Proverbs 30, verse 12 says, There are those who are clean in their own eyes, but are not washed of their own filth. Peace in conscience can be a gift of the gospel, truly. But we cannot rely on looking to our conscience alone to give us assurance that we are right with God. This man left, the Pharisee left the temple believing that he was justified. And he wasn't. We must be careful how we view ourselves. As Robert Murray McShane put it, the seeds of all sins are in my heart. And perhaps all the more dangerously, I do not see them. All sins. Do you believe that about yourself? That if it wasn't for restraining circumstances or the restraining of the Holy Spirit, that you could be given to all sins? The seeds of all sins are in each of our hearts. Now before moving on from this Pharisee's prayer, we do need to recognize a snare here. We must not be too quick to identify with the tax collector and kick the Pharisee to the curb. That's what I want to do. Maybe you want to do that too. No, there's a snare here that you and I speed on by and we become self-righteous about not being self-righteous. Maybe we find ourselves saying, God, I thank you that I'm not like that self-congratulating, self-exalting, prideful, self-righteous Pharisee. We must be careful how we view ourselves. Where do we find help? Well, Jesus in this passage points us to the prayer of the tax collector for help and for guidance. There, Jesus describes a different posture in a different location. This Pharisee has put himself prominently somewhere in the temple up front in the hour of prayer. But this tax collector... He must have been a Presbyterian because he wanted to be in the back and sit. But for different reasons that many of you like to sit in the back as prime seats. This man wasn't there for the attention of others. Not saying that those who sit in the back. Anyway, this is, this is devolving. <laughs> He's there in the back because he doesn't believe he belongs in the front. He addresses himself to God as the sinner. He's there before God. Now, in the English it says a sinner. In the Greek there's the definite article, and this will be a time that it's appropriate to supply it because it gives insight into this man's prayer. He's saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Surrounded by others, but unlike the Pharisee, He's not concerned with the sins of others. He's not concerned with what others think about him. Remember that the tax collector, if the Pharisee is upheld as the ultimate example for the Jews of a moral and upright man, the tax collector is the complete opposite of that. He 
he is despised universally by his countrymen because as a tax collector, he is working for the Roman government that is oppressing the Jewish people and he is collecting taxes and collecting a little bit above the taxes required in order to fatten his own pockets. So here is a Jew getting rich off of Roman occupancy and Roman dominance of the Jewish people. It's a wonder that he would even step foot in the temple. But he does. And we see so that there is a, a sense of desperation in this man. It's not that he arrived in the temple that day that he is trying to show some sort of face that people would see him there and say, maybe he's not that bad of a tax collector. He's come to pray. No, it would seem that by his posture, his place, his prayer, that he has been driven to the temple to seek God out of desperation. And so he stands there beating his chest over and over again. This is not something that men normally did in prayer in the temple. Normal posture of prayer in the temple was to stand when lift your eyes towards heaven. This man is bowing his head, beating his chest. Jews, they would beat their chest in public when something was terribly grievous. And so in Luke chapter 23, the crowds that saw Jesus die on the cross and they don't understand what happened. They might have gone out to the crucifixion that day to mock Jesus and they come away confounded and grieving over what they just witnessed. They leave, it says, in Luke 23, beating their chest. And here this man, grieving over his sin in desperation, has slipped into the temple, beating his chest, crying out to God and saying, I'm the sinner. And when he cries for mercy, he uses an interesting word. He says, be merciful to me. And this mercy he is asking for is not simply, I am in need and you are able to help. It's not just a cry for help. It's more than that. There is the common use of mercy that you see in different places in the scripture, but this is a more technical use of the term mercy. It is equivalent to saying, make atonement for me. It is the word hilasterion. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 there, the writer of Hebrews uses the word, and in our English translation, it's translated propitiation. Propitiation, that the wrath of God is appeased by a sacrifice. This is his cry for mercy. It's most likely during the evening offering where the priest is bringing the, the daily offering, the sacrifice before the altar. And here, this tax collector who slipped in, who's barely lifting up his eyes occasionally, he's glancing forward and saying, that offering up there for sin, I need it. God, would you make atonement for me? Could there be a sacrifice for my sin? There's nothing I can do. You must provide that is a sense of this man's prayer. J.C. Rollins said, the right knowledge of sin lies at the root of all saving Christianity. And this tax collector seems to have been brought to a knowledge of his sin and his only hope and a sacrifice in his place. We must pay attention how we view others. We must be careful how we view ourselves. And we can have true assurance by looking to Christ alone for justification. This man brings nothing to the temple to commend him to God and leaves justified. Not because of what he offered, but because what Christ himself would offer for sinners like him. Jesus stands as the son of God telling this parable and says, I'm the one who determines who's just and who is condemned. Who will be justified? That is my determination because I'm the one who will give the sacrifice make the atonement 
that sinners like this tax collector need. And to be clear, when Jesus speaks of one man going justified home and the other man not going home justified, the point of the parable isn't saying, if you want to be justified, don't hold others in contempt. The point of the parable is saying that if you find in your heart contempt for others, question what you were leaning on for your justification. Because those who've been justified by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, they see their fellow sinner differently. And to be clear, we could go even further that when Jesus says that everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted, it is not saying that humility is in place of righteousness. It's saying that those who are trusting in Christ alone, they find themselves so humbled because there's nothing that they can offer. So we affix our attention to the cross of Jesus. And in doing so, we can leave behind false assurance. And in the cross, find a sure cure for self-righteousness. There, beholding what our sins deserved and the price our Savior paid. And from Him and from Him alone, receiving the gift of pardon and His righteousness. It's often quoted, and it's appropriate, as a good reminder from Augustus Top Lady, from his hymn, Rock of Ages, Nothing in my hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. Amen. Let's ask for God's blessing on the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we ask for forgiveness. Oh, forgive us if we thought we could, in our own righteousness, contribute anything meriting salvation. Oh, forgive us if we have looked down upon others, considering ourselves is more holy, more righteous than they, and therefore more deserving of your favor and love. And everything we have comes to us by way of gift. Everything that we have comes to us not because we deserve it, but by your sovereign grace purchased by the blood of your own Son. And so may we exalt in Him alone May we find no boasting in ourselves, but only boast in the cross of our Lord and lay aside our filthy rags and receive His righteousness and know the rest and peace and assurance that comes from trusting in Christ and Him alone. In His name we pray. Amen. Let's respond to the preaching of God's word, singing together, not in me. Oh, list of sins I have not done, no list of virtues I no list of hopes I have not died Can earn myself a place with you Oh God, be merciful to me I am a sinner through and through My only hope of righteousness is not in me, but oh.
lifted hands, no tearful song, no recitation of the truth can justify. the blessing from God's Word. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in the peace of our Lord. Amen.